I need to start with an apology this morning because when I first found this newspaper clipping a few months ago, I thought it was kind of good and I hadn't noticed at first back then that it was kind of meant to rhyme and it rhymes very badly. So I am going to read it to you because it says, because it says something worth saying in what I think was originally a letter to the editor. But at the same time, I am apologising and cringing a little bit because of the very bad poetry that it is. But here it is. When I say that I'm a Christian, I'm not shouting that I'm clean living. I'm whispering I was lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my guide. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need his strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I've failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I'm a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's grace somehow. Now, you can see what I mean. The metre is all wrong and clean living doesn't even rhyme with forgiven. Uh, Perfect doesn't rhyme with worth it. Pain doesn't rhyme with name. But the point is pretty good. In spite of what most people think, in spite of the public perception, Christians are simply lost people found and forgiven. Stumbling people needing a guide. Weak, failed, flawed aching sinners who have found grace and mercy. Or at least that's how it should be. And yet so often and so easily we give the impression, don't we, and I'm sure this is how most people out there see us, we give the impression that we are Ned Flanders on The Simpsons. Holier than now, bragging of our successes. We're the ones who is right when everyone else has got it so wrong. I guess, self-righteous would be the tag a lot of ordinary Aussies would use if you asked them to describe Christians. Which simply shouldn't be if you take a look at the opening words of what is in a way the sermon that launched Christianity. The Sermon on the Mount, most famous sermon ever preached. It's the home of great lines like, love your enemies, of Words like don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, of going the extra mile. This is the Lord's Prayer in this sermon. It's where it started. An expression like wolves in sheep's clothing. They're all here, words and phrases that are part of everyday English, all started here in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount starts where we're starting this morning with with this list of blessings that's often called the Beatitudes, which is just the Latin word for blessings. Familiar words, perhaps, that when you read them surely make you think that it's incredible that there could ever be such a thing as a self-righteous Christian, ever. That it's incredible to think that a a movement that starts with these words would ever need to be defended 2,000 years later by a second-rate poem saying you shouldn't think we're the proud and bragging holier-than-thou people. So many people think we are. But before we go too far in that direction and look at the Sermon on the Mount as the sermon that launched Christianity, I want to think back for a moment to the original audience and consider the Sermon on the Mount as, in a sense, the sermon that finished Israel. This is a turning point sermon. And we're going to see that more in the next couple of weeks. This is a call for decision sermon. This is a sermon that's drawing a line in the sand. It's a sermon that in every breath is making a distinction between what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law stand for and what Jesus and his followers are going to stand for, which are two radically different models. It's a sermon that contrasts more and more clearly, and today we're only at the start, that that contrasts self-righteous religion full of pride and self-importance with the other option 
of simple, humble hearts. And it says to Israel, make up your minds. You are the guys who want to call yourselves the people of God. You are the ones who think of yourselves as citizens of the kingdom. So here is what living in the kingdom is going to look like. And if you're a Pharisee, maybe it's not quite what you're expecting. Now, I know it's maybe a little bit dry doing this stuff, but there is actually a benefit, I think, in in catching on to the fact that the Sermon on the Mount was first of all to Israel before it was to us. And at some points, as we'll see in following weeks, it's, it's actually going to make quite a difference when you catch the edge in what Jesus is saying. That there is a critique here that's slicing through the self-righteousness of Israel like a knife. That it's part of the story and of the drama and the tension that's building as Jesus is preaching around the synagogues of northern Israel, preaching the good news of the kingdom while he heals the sick and drives out demons and unparalyzes the paralysed. And the point is... If you're an Israelite and you had been reading the words of the prophet Isaiah and if you had been listening to the preaching of John the Baptist, none of it's a surprise. Now, it is Isaiah who first said, the problem with Israel is that Israel is like a brood of vipers. You remember John the Baptist's words last week? Well, have a look here on the screen. Isaiah said this, Are you not a brood of rebels? No one calls for justice. They hatch the eggs of vipers. Which is exactly what John the Baptist, you see, picks up. He says, Isaiah was right. That's what he calls the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 3. As we saw, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. And it's Isaiah long ago who says to Israel in their exile, to, to an Israel destroyed, to a nation longing to be put back together, It's Isaiah who said, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Who's speaking on behalf of God says, the man who makes me his refuge will inherit the land. Who says, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. It's Isaiah who looks forward to the one who says, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to proclaim the Lord's favour in the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now look, they're all bits of quotes that make their way into the Sermon on the Mount. And if you are the curious theological type, it's worth you reading right through the last section of Isaiah sometime, chapter 40 through to 66, and see the story of stubborn, proud Israel and the servant who will come to bring righteousness to those who are hungry for it and bring judgment for the rest. Who will restore broken Israel, says Isaiah, who will lead the way back from exile, who will put things back together again, who will open the doors to all kinds of people from everywhere, give them blessing, include them instead of shutting them out. The one who will deal with sin once for all and restore God's blessing to his people. And what do God's people need to do to be ready? Well, Isaiah says to be in mourning about how things are, not complacent. To be spiritually poor rather than primping and pretentious. To be hungry and thirsty for righteousness instead of being self-righteous. Now, that's what Isaiah said. And you know, it's exactly how Jesus puts it. There is nothing new here now that he's turned up in person and you see the best Israel can do is offer the Pharisees as an example of getting it right. Who you are going to see Jesus absolutely sledging in these next couple of chapters. But before we get too caught up in finger pointing at the Pharisees, let's take a look now at the Sermon on the Mount and particularly the Beatitudes as a sermon to us. Because if you have at any point stepped up and counted yourself a Christian, if you have at any point been attracted to following Jesus, these words are definitional of what it's got to be all about. It's a potted summary of everything that was ever wrong with Israel 
But surely it's got to be a potted summary of everything that should be right with us as Christians, as people who have now opted in. This is what you've stepped up for. And sometimes you say, I wonder if we've lost sight of it in the process of becoming more impressive, in the process of becoming more moral and upstanding, of becoming the people in the community who want to say what's wrong about everyone else. Blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3. Is that you? What's it going to feel like? I guess it's going to feel like saying, well, as a Christian, I don't amount to much. As a spiritual giant, I'm really just a pygmy. It's going to feel like saying, when it comes to being spiritual, I need help. Well, guess what, says Jesus. People like that, the kingdom's theirs. I'm vaguely reminded, I think, I didn't go back and check this, but of a, of a, a little bit in the story of Alice, of Wonder, Alice in Wonderland where, where Alice desperately wants to get through a door and she can't until she drinks the potion and becomes tiny and there's the key and the door opens easily. It's a tiny little door. See, becoming less is the only way through. Jesus says it's like that. I wonder if you look through the photos in our church directory later on, maybe there are people in there you have hardly even noticed, who week by week you've just overlooked, seem like nobodies. Or maybe you've been overlooking exactly the people who get it. And you don't. The poor in spirit. Come on in, says Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, verse 4, for they will be comforted. Which is one of those Isaiah things where, where he's been saying, don't be proud of how things are, grieve over it. I noticed with the gay Mardi Gras in Sydney last week, some, some Christians were praying that God would rain on the parade in his judgement, that they'd just be flooded out to show how angry God is with them. But there was one Christian leader who put out a statement that said this, that his prayer was that we should see the rain more as tears and as a sign of God's promise to wash clean anyone who repents. See, that's blessed, those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, verse 5, for they will inherit the earth which in the original language, according to my Greek dictionary, is the word praeus, which is not the word that means doormat, and it's not the word that translates wimps, but the word that means gentle strength, the opposite to harsh. In an Israel that thought might was right, Jesus said it is the gentle who will inherit the land. In fact, Matthew eleven twenty nine, Jesus uses the same word of himself, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, do you want to learn the art of gentle strength? Jesus says, watch me, as we should. Do you want to see strength that's used for the good of others instead of self? Do you want to see strength that's controlled and humble and impressive? Jesus. If you've been doing the parenting teenagers course, you might remember that. That's the model for parenting. Not ineffectual, gentle and weak. Not manipulative, not authoritarian. Loving but strong. It's a Jesus model. It's good for husbanding as well. It's a Jesus model for leading at work. Gentle, strong blessed to those. Next blessing, verse 6. Blessed, says Jesus, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, Bruce Springsteen says everybody's got a hungry heart, which is why he dumped his wife and kids back in Baltimore and he's never been back, which is maybe why people just never seem satisfied. They've got hungry hearts. You're broke and you're not satisfied. You get rich, you're still not satisfied. You're single, you're not satisfied. You get married, you're still not satisfied. You're renting, you're not satisfied. You buy a house, you're still not satisfied. 
Well, Jesus says, are you hungry like that for righteousness? Do you really, really, really want to be right and do right from the heart? Because if you do, says Jesus, I've got some very good news. Stick with me and you'll be filled. Now, if you want to know how that pans out, you'll need to be here for the rest of the story and see how Matthew's gospel plays out, how Jesus brings that righteousness for those who follow. But it's at the very heart of our gospel. It's the essence of our message. Not that we are better than anyone else or holier than thou, but that when you come to Jesus hungry and thirsty for righteousness, he's going to give you a drink with ice cubes, a little umbrella and a straw. It's going to be delicious. He's going to set you a banquet with entree. And then you will be merciful in verse 7. And then you will be pure in heart, verse 8. And then you will be a peacemaker, verse 9. And yet then you will be persecuted because of righteousness, verse 10. Which is the same as saying the words in verse 11 where Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Which for the first disciples is exactly how it turned out to be and for disciples ever since as well. That you will be insulted because of Jesus. That you will be persecuted because of Jesus. That you will be falsely maligned in all kinds of unfair ways by your workmates, by your classmates, by the rest of the world. And yet Jesus says, blessed are you anyway, where it counts. How much better to have the kingdom of God, to have the comfort of God, to inherit the earth, to be full of righteousness, to see God, to be called his sons and daughters. It's worth the pain. Rejoice and be glad, verse 12. Because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. They being the rest of Israel. That's exactly what they did. The one who called themselves the people of God. It's odd, isn't it? If you read back through the Old Testament, the proud and the arrogant, the religious elite of Israel, they have always done that. So don't be surprised, says Jesus, but join me anyway. It's worth it. Be what Israel always should have been. The salt of the earth, the city on the hill, a light shining out to the rest of the world, showing good deeds that bring praise to our Father in heaven. It's actually a big warning for Israel in the words of verse 13. Unflavoured salt. It's just another name for sand, really. John the Baptist said, the axe is already at the root of the tree, make up your minds. Well, Jesus says to them, if you're not going to be salty, you're good for nothing, except being thrown underfoot and trampled by men, which is a phrase that he uses in chapter 7, verse 6 as well. Israel, if you're not careful, you're going to be trampled and replaced. Again, you've got to keep reading the story to see what's going to happen. But the short version is, Israel's leaders... I hope this isn't going to spoil it. But as you keep reading the story, they are going to say no to Jesus. And people like us have said yes. Which, of course, makes it all the more tragic, all the more surprising when you do see people who want to go by the name Christian making exactly the same mistakes all over again. Pride. Self-righteousness, pomp and circumstance, harshness with the failing of other people, (coughs) judgmental maybe. So I just want to ask you this morning, is there any of that in you? Or do you need another reminder from that very bad poem? Maybe just the lines with the least offensive rhymes. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my God. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need his strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's grace somehow. 